we start with a prayer, if we may, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Seat of Wisdom, St. Thomas Aquinas, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Now, long and bitter experience has taught me that it's not worth uh, fretting and losing sleep over what I'm going to say. So just so that you know, I have not prepared this at all. However, we'll just see what comes out. I know what I want to say, and I know what's important, and, and I know what um, I know what I know, and I know what you need to know. And if I don't make myself clear at all, please feel free. Uh, to ask questions. In fact, please do ask questions because very often that's where the most, uh, if you listen to talks of any kind, quite often it's in the questions at the end that the really interesting stuff comes out, so don't be shy. Um, one other thing, shameless plug, that's a lot of what I'm going to say is already in here, so I, well, I make no apology for it, it's there. Not everything. Um, <coughs> but you'll see. Right, what are we doing here? Why are we here? What is this all about? What, what are we doing? Well, essentially we're doing nothing new. We're doing nothing novel and we're doing nothing of our own. We don't want to do anything novel. We don't want to do anything of our own. We're Catholics. That's all we are. And that's all we want to be. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, we are very conscious and very aware of the words of St. Paul. If I or an angel from heaven, you all know it. And it, the, the, uh, as has been pointed out many times before, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. The point about what St. Paul says is, if I or an angel from heaven preach anything other than, anything different from, he doesn't say it has to be something bad. He just says it has to be something different. In any way different. Um, and as Father Jacques Van quite rightly said yesterday, Bona ex integra causa malum ex quocumque defectu. There only has to be one little thing different, and then that counts. And if it's, if it's the same, it has to be 100% the same. Okay, if we're Catholic, we have to be 100% Catholic. If you're 99.9% Catholic, you're not Catholic. It's not difficult to understand. Okay, it's, um, that's what this is about. We call ourselves traditional Catholics. We call ourselves the resistance. Once in a while, everybody will uh, somebody will come along and they will say, oh, "I don't call myself a traditional. I don't like that. I'm not a I'm just a Catholic. Resi I'm not resistant. I'm just a Catholic." And I, uh, that sentiment has my full and complete sympathy, and it's, it's absolutely the truth. Now, unfortunately, because of the world that we live in, we need to uh, distinguish. And between right and wrong, good and bad, and we need to identify ourselves. So we call ourselves traditional Catholics. Why? Because there are people out there who call themselves Catholics, and they believe that you can be saved in any religion, that the truth needs to be changed and updated, etc., etc., etc. They're Catholics in, in name only. So we have to distinguish ourselves from them. It's unfortunate. It's not a situation that we desired. It's not a situation that we created. But it's here, so we have to deal with it. And in fact, when you think about it, that's the reason why we call ourselves Catholics. Why is it we don't call ourselves Christians? We don't call ourselves Christians because there are people out there who, Protestants, uh, Eastern Orthodox, and so on, they call themselves Christians, but they don't have all the books of the Bible. They don't believe uh, in sacred tradition. They don't believe in perpetual virginity of Our Lady, and so on, and so on. We it's very important that we distinguish <coughs> ourselves from them. So we don't call ourselves Christian, we call ourselves Catholic. <coughs> because the truth matters. And without the truth, there isn't anything. With the truth, it doesn't matter the fact that we're in a hotel room and not a church, and so on and so forth. God doesn't need, um, he doesn't need uh, impressive external things. He just needs sincerity of heart. He needs people who are going to stick to the truth come what may. Now, a little bit of history. I learned the other day of the uh, 
uh, decease of an old friend of mine. Please say a, a, a prayer for the repose of his soul. His name was John Olner. Some of you knew him. Um, John Olner, <coughs> I met quite by chance in 2003 at Bristol. And it turned out that he was SSPX and I was SSPX. We got along like a house on fire. And I said to him, oh, in a couple of days I'm going to St. Michael's School to be conditionally confirmed by Bishop Tissier. And he said, oh, how wonderful. Um, I'd love to come with you. But did you go to St. Michael's School? And I said, no, I, I, you won't have heard of it. I went to a school up in Lancashire called Stonyhurst. I went to Stonyhurst. He went to the same school as me, but he went there about 50 years before I was there. So whereas when I was there, there were about three elderly Jesuit priests who said the new mass, and it was all kind of, it was very sad, um, the ravages of modernism. When he was there, it was the glory of the Catholic Church, and it was a powerhouse for converting England back to the Catholic faith. Um, he invited me to his house one time, and he was showing me all these old photos from the 1940s and 50s when, when he was at Stonyhurst College with the Jesuits. The Blessed Sacrament procession they had on Corpus Christi he used to go across the fields to the local village a mile and a half away with a marching band in front of it and 30 priests and, and a huge golden canopy. You know, it was wonderful. Um, and they had chapels and altars all over the place and a sodality of Our Lady and a Catholic evidence guild where the boys used to practice inside the school and the other boys used to come up and heckle them and then the priest used to take them into the local town and they would do it for real and they got real converts and all this kind of thing. It was wonderful. Now, he said to me, the Society of St. Pius X, that's just, that's what it was like. This is kind of a little taste of what it was like, only even better. And he, he said, I, I came back to tradition, and I recognised in the Society of St. Pius X, that's what I remember. That's what it was like. He said, this new church is completely different. I don't recognise it at all. That is not the religion I was brought up in. It's not the same religion. I don't recognise it at all, this, this new mass and all this liberalism. Now, John Olner is a very interesting case in point. Why do I mention him? Please do remember to pray for the repose of his soul. He was a good man. He, uh, <coughs> he's a case, one among many thousands, millions even. He was brought up Catholic in the 1940s and 50s. Vatican II happened. He lapsed. I can't tell you the exact year. I can't remember it. But essentially, he lapsed basically just after the council, whether it was the late 60s or early 70s, it was about the time that the new mass came out. He lapsed, and he stayed lapsed for many years. He didn't go to mass at all. Um, he stayed away from the church. He was a lapsed Catholic for maybe 25, 30 years, and then one day, accidentally, he bumped into the Society of St. Pius X. I say accidentally, there's no doubt at all it was Providence this is how Almighty God works. But he found this SSPX chapel, he found the traditional Latin Mass, <coughs> and after 30 odd years of having never set foot in a church, he picked up where he left off. He didn't have to be converted again, he didn't have to have a course of catechism, it didn't take a, a period of adjustment, he just picked up where he left off, as though it were just from one day to the other, but with 30 years in between. And now he had many friends who went to school with him, to Stonyhurst College, back in the glory days. They're all modernists, every single one of them. Why? Because they didn't lapse. They went to Mass every Sunday, to the new Mass. And after 30 years of going to the new Mass, they believe you can be saved in any religion, etc., 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 etc. You, you all know this, I'm, I don't need to go into detail. Now, why do I mention this one example? Is there anything extraordinary <coughs> about the example of my old friend John Olner? No. I mention it precisely because it's not extraordinary. It's the same thing you see again and again and again. That generation is dying off already, and in another 10, 15, 20 years they will be gone. But people, not just in London, not just in England, all over the world, people have friends, relatives, family, acquaintances, and they can point to similar examples where somebody who went to the new mass, somebody who went along with the new religion, with the liberalism, with the modernism, drip, 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 drip over the course of 30 years, they turned into a modernist, and the worst thing about it is they didn't realise it was happening. And yet people who lapsed didn't and were cut off, and 
when they came back to the traditional mass, they weren't affected. It's the great wisdom of Archbishop Lefebvre telling people, don't go to that new mass. And some of you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to mention <coughs> the name, there's a lady in London uh, who was born overseas, um, uh, I think in the Caribbean, and there was no Tridentine mass there at all in the 1980s and 70s, probably isn't still as far as I know. But um, her father uh, didn't want to go to the new mass, and so he stopped going to mass and just said his rosary at home on Sunday, and his wife was horrified, and, and she... They heard about Archbishop Lefebvre, um, this French Archbishop who was going around opposing Vatican II, and uh, the wife wrote to Archbishop Lefebvre and said, please do something, my husband isn't going to Mass anymore. Tell him, he has to go to Mass. And Archbishop Lefebvre wrote back, guess what he said? Dear Madam, I'm... I, I'm very sorry to have to tell you this, you're very sincere, etc., etc., but the fact is, your husband is right. You should not go to that Mass. Now, that's only one example. I only know about that because the lady is here in London, she told me herself. Again, how many other examples are there? I only mention it, not because it's unusual, but because it's, it's completely normal, it's 100% ordinary. Everywhere, everybody in the world will have similar examples. This is the very great wisdom of Archbishop Lefebvre. Now, this is so obvious, we shouldn't even be discussing this right now. But, if we are going to be Catholics, if we are going to maintain the truth, if we are going to be 100% bonum ex integra causa, then we can't afford to change anything that we teach. And more than that, we have a duty, you and I. I'm talking to you because I'm a layman. I'm the same as you. Right? I don't have any particular special duty or gift or charism or anything else that you don't have yourselves. Now, what is our duty? Our duty is to maintain the truth. More than that, our duty is to oppose error. It's not something that we do if we feel like it. It's not something which earns us extra brownie points. It's the default position. And I don't want, when I die, to go in front of our Lord in front of the judgment of God, and he will say, here's what would have happened had you done this, here's what you did, Look what, or here's what you neglected to do, look at the result. So, in 2013, we started the resistance. Now, Father Pfeiffer gave you a bit of a potted uh, sort of history of the resistance across the world yesterday. Very briefly, I'll just run you through the same thing, but as regards to just England. So the same kind of thing, but we're just zooming in the map onto England. What happened in England? Well, 2012, we started to realise something was going on. I suppose there were probably rumours going around in the background, as in most countries. But for most people, it, when it started to come out in about April 2012, I think Bishop Fellow gave an interview uh, with this Novus Ordo, Catholic News Service, CNS, and he said, you know what, with our discussion with Rome, we suddenly discovered that all these bad things we thought were from Vatican II, we discovered they weren't really from the Council after all, but just the common understanding of it. And he said plenty of other things like that. Religious liberty is really, you know, it's not, it's not a big problem. It's very, very limited in the Council, and it doesn't mean what people think it means. And I really have the impression that not many people have read Vatican II. That's, he's right about that. Not many people have... Just by the way, not many people have read Vatican II. They've got more common sense than that. Take it from me, I've read six of the documents of Vatican II, and I consider that a heroic effort of perseverance. It's unreadable. It's virtually unreadable. It's just politically correct waffle, and it goes on and on. It's a cure for insomnia. Don't bother trying to read it. But if you have read it, then you'll know exactly how bad Vatican II is. Right? It's not something that happened just after the council, everybody decided to misinterpret it. No, nope, the problem is in the council itself. It's full of heresies and errors, there's no question about it. Um, so we got alarmed at this, because the Society of St. Pius X was the bastion of truth, and we supported it because of what it represented, not because it's the SSPX. What is the SSPX? It's an organisation. There are lots of organisations, lots of religious orders and so on, but because of what it represented, it represented tradition. And in 2012, some of us wrote an open letter to Bishop Fellay, I think 200 and something odd, not, probably not quite 250, 230 people signed this letter saying, we, the very last bit said, 
we hope that the SSPX, the cause of the SSPX, will be the cause of tradition, just as it always has been. Okay, and we intend to carry on with tradition. Whether that means that the SSPX is with us or not, and whether that means that you're going to be with us or not, that was the sentiment. 2013, uh, Father Pfeiffer um, and Father Hugo, and in fact Father Kramer, were here um, just down the road in Earlsfield, and we had our conference there. And we, that was when really the resistance got off the ground, because the thing that alarms us is the sliding liberalism in the SSPX. Now you have to be very careful. Don't take for granted the fact that you are a traditional Catholic. Don't take for granted the fact that you have the faith. Other people better than you have lost the faith. Don't take it. It's a gift from Almighty God. If you have got the Catholic faith, if I've got the Catholic faith, well, let me stop talking about you. I will talk about myself. I do not deserve to be a Catholic. And I don't deserve to be a traditional Catholic. And I don't understand why it is that I am. Other people, more intelligent than I, have ended up not being traditional Catholics. And other people with a sort of better background than I, um, who had a, you know, better advantages than I, have ended up not with the Catholic faith, and somehow I've ended up with it. Don't take it for granted, you can lose it. You can lose it. One of the ways that you lose it, the devil is very clever, he won't get you, he won't put you in a situation where he says to you, uh, tread on the crucifix, spit on Christ, blaspheme, worship Satan, or will be executed. Because he knows there will be some people who will choose execution. What he will do is he'll make you make little compromises where it's less obvious. They used to say that in the days of the um, Soviet bloc behind the Iron Curtain, the way that the communists would, would get people and recruit them, it's the same here in England when they, the KGB was recruiting people in Cambridge, uh, they, would, they wouldn't go to them and say, we want you to be a communist agent and sell your country out. They'd start by just one little thing and one little thing and then a slightly bigger thing and then a slightly bigger thing and a slightly bigger thing. Um, and in fact, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Cold War, uh, the, 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 the spy, the intelligence war, when they turned somebody and made him a double agent, they would get him to start. They wouldn't, they wouldn't first of all ask for... Um, suppose the KGB got an MI5 agent and start betraying MI5. They would not start by saying, give us the blueprints to the you know, nuclear submarines. They'd, they would start by asking for something that was of no consequence. We want you to steal for us the tea-making roster from the tea room and a list of who has sugar in their coffee and who doesn't. Something completely inconsequential so that the person would say, well, you know, what harm, harm can that do? and they would go along with it. And then next time it would be something slightly more important but of no consequence. And a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Now this was the danger. We decided with the Society of St. Pius X the doctrine has changed and they now accept Vatican II. And if anybody doubts that at all I invite you to look honestly at Bishop Fellay's doctrinal declaration of April 2012. What is a doctrinal declaration? The title says it all. Its purpose is to declare doctrine. It's not a private thought. It's not something whimsical and being proposed. What do you think about this? It's been declared. And it's been declared to the Roman authorities, to modernist Rome, on our behalf. You will notice that every paragraph begins, we declare that we accept. Now, who, who is that we? Well, it doesn't, I'm not part of that, and, and I hope you're not part of it. When he says, we declare that we accept the new mass was legitimately promulgated, he's not speaking on my behalf. When he says, we declare that uh, but essentially tradition must be seen in the light of Vatican II, no, that, I'm not one of that we. I do not belong to that we. So we started the resistance in London, June 2013 to preserve the faith. And in London and in Scotland at the same time, the resistance began openly. We, when we didn't have mass, when we didn't have a priest, we said our rosary together um, and we had a sort of holy hour and we sanctified the Sunday, we met together and we said the rosary. We're still doing it to this day. Not necessarily all the same people, for various reasons which I will come to shortly. 
Um, we started with a give or take probably 50 or so people in London, 50 to 60 in London maybe, and the surrounding areas of London. And there were about 20, 25 people in Scotland uh, near Glasgow at the same time who said the same thing. We can't do this anymore. We're not going to the Society of Suppliers Attend. This is something new. We want to keep the faith. Okay, so they, they, they stopped going up there. So two groups. Um, Father Pfeiffer said to us, I will try and come over to England and say Mass for you once in a while, but I have to be honest with you, it's not going to be very often, maybe once every two months at most. But trust in God. Trust in divine providence you'll be taken care of. Which is sound advice, by the way, because it's been said so many times, but I'll say it again because it's true. God is never outdone in generosity. Every time you make a sacrifice for him, he, he will give you something as a reward. Even bigger. So we did. We did exactly that. Now, at that point in time, a certain bishop, who many of you know, was living in London, and he was saying Mass privately, in his, uh, on a sort of um, sideboard in his living room with a congregation of zero, and I said to him, this is just silly. You're, you're in London, we're in London, we don't have any Mass because we don't have a priest, you've been kicked out of the society. Uh, by, the, by the people who have taken it over. Um, we don't have Mass. You don't have anyone to say Mass for. Come and say Mass for us. And I asked him three times. The first time he said no. The second time he said no. He said it's very tempting, but no. And the third time I said, you have to do this, it's your duty. And he said, all right, okay. So he turned up and he started saying Mass for us. Now, uh, I can go into details. Uh, I will spare you the, some of the details. Let's just say over the course of the next year or so, the vision went, the clarity went, the enthusiasm went. The members were cut in half or more. Scotland went down to about 15 people. London went down to about 20 or so. Um, and through a huge amount of evidence and first-hand things that I've witnessed, I, you can take my word for it or I can go into more detail later if you wish. It's 100% because of what Bishop Williamson was doing and saying to people. Every single time anybody came to him and asked his advice, he, he undermined the clarity of vision. He told people, go back to the society. He even told that to people who he knew perfectly well had decided never to go back to the SSPX and who hadn't asked him his advice. He, he gave unsolicited advice to people, go back to the society. And it's very difficult because what are we meant to do? Um, so, uh, 2013 wore on into 2014. Father Abraham came and said Mass for us a couple of times. I won't go into details. Uh, you all know what you know, and if you don't, well, you don't. Um, we said to Father Abraham, don't worry about coming to say Mass for us. That's all right. You stay home. Because well, the first day that he turned up, he announced that I'm not a resistance priest. I've got nothing to do with the resistance. And in fact, I disagree with you guys on a number of points. Uh, we thought, well, what on earth are you doing here? <laughs> well, what are, more to the point, what are we doing here? Because if it's all about getting mass as often as possible and at any cost, well then we might as well go here or there already. Might as well go to the SSPX, might as well go to the Novus Auto Church down the street. What's the point? Um, so we said to Father Abraham, you don't need to come and say mass for us. I tried to be as nice as possible about it, but it's kind of difficult basically. <laughs> yeah, the most important thing there is to be clear and unequivocal. At the end of 2014, um, in view of a number of uh, scandals and really, really wicked, selfish advice that Bishop Williamson was giving to people, I said to him, don't. I said, essentially, don't come anymore, please. Um, what triggered that? I was, I was hoping to avoid it, and I did. Uh, God knows, and Almighty God is a witness, I'm not telling you anything that's untrue here. 
I tried not to cause any kind of division. But Bishop Williamson asked me at the end of, end of the year in 2014, end of November, early December 2014, he said, I'll come and say Mass for you in two weeks' time, but only if you want me to, only if you want me to. Only if you, you're sure that you want me here, then I'll come. If you don't want me to come, that's no problem, just let me know. But if you really do want me to come, then I'll come and say Mass for you. Um, and I originally, to, to be diplomatic, I thought I would accidentally on purpose forget to reply to that email, and then once the deadline had come and gone, he wouldn't have had a yes reply from me, and then he wouldn't end up coming, and I wouldn't actually have to say no to him. But he was very persistent. He rang me up, I didn't answer the phone, he left a voicemail. I didn't reply to it, he rang my wife. And so it went on, and after all, I, I, I said to myself, finally, okay, I have to deal with it honestly, and in a straightforward manner. So I wrote a very, very long email to him, saying, these are our concerns. Please help me to understand why it is you are saying this to this person and that to that person. And why it is that you are causing all of this damage. And if I'm answering your question honestly, then the honest answer, I have to say, is no. Um, no reply for two weeks, and then after two weeks I got a very short little email from him, uh, which was completely flippant, ignored everything I had said, and a little poem making fun of me. <laughs> so that was his reply. But then it was announced that there was a new resistance mass in London, which was uh, a rival for us, and they secretly rang round everybody, telephoned them up and said, this, you know, this guy broke down. He's just an extremist. You know, don't listen to him. Come with us. You, you get mass every week with us. And they're still going to this day. Um, it's just down the street here, not very far away. They have mass every Sunday. And it's, and it's a chapel run by two priests, Bishop Williamson and Father Abraham, both of whom tell people and teach publicly that there is no problem at all about going to the SSPX. Now... Whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I ask you, consider the following, please. Both the people who say Mass at that chapel and who support that chapel say that there is no need for a resistance chapel. What is the purpose of that place existing if it's okay for you to go to the SSPX? It doesn't make any sense unless you see it through the lens of it's there as a rival to try to shut us down. It's still going to this day. I think we, we went down to about six or seven people for Mass after we said goodbye to Bishop Williamson, and then the numbers have come back up now. We're back up to about 25 to 30 people for Mass on Sunday. They've got about, I think, 10 or 12 people going to Mass there. I don't know. I've never actually been. I, one of these days, I'll just sneak in the back and do a head count and run off again. <laughs> uh, Bishop Four, I think in a conference in America that he gave in English, he, he said, um, I've been and said Mass uh, in Father Abraham's chapel and it was about 15 people. Well, if it's 15 people for Bishop Four, it's probably about 10 people on a normal Sunday. I don't know. Anyway, but since then, 2014, uh, we, uh, okay, let me preface this by saying, one of the things that Father Pfeiffer said to us is you can't be selfish. And again, I, I want to repeat this because it's not only very true, it's also extremely important that we take this on board. We cannot afford to be selfish. There is always a tendency to say, I need my Mass every Sunday, I need my sacraments. As long as I've got my Mass, the rest of the world can just go to hell. So this, that, I'm sorry, is not the Catholic attitude. And it's not the attitude that you see in our forefathers um, in the, the, the Catholics that Edmund Campion ministered to, for example, that is not the correct attitude. It's, we're in this fight together, and it's not a personal thing. This is a worldwide fight for the faith. We can't afford to be selfish. So this is what we tried to do. Um, we, we spread the resistance. We, we, uh, if ever we had a, mass, uh, a priest here for Mass on Sunday, we would take him elsewhere in the country to whoever... Whoever called, basically, whoever would benefit and whoever wanted a resistance priest to show up for Mass, um, we tried to make sure that as much as possible we, the priest could travel around and do sick calls and bring communion here in the and so on. It's very difficult to do. Um, I shouldn't be running this and organising this as a layman. I'm very conscious of that, but the only reason I'm doing it is because there is nobody else doing it. We've got a bishop resident in this country 
who not only has not done this, he's done everything to try to uh, impede this. So, from London and Scotland, in 2014, the resistance began in Liverpool with about 15 people uh, in, in a room in the Liner Hotel in Liverpool, and we managed to keep them going with mass not quite once a month, I think over a period of about 15 months they probably had mass 12 or 13 times. Um, all the way up to uh, May 2015 when Father King left the SSPX, God bless him, uh, and joined the resistance and took them over and they now, thanks to Father King, they have an evening mass every week. Um, we uh, also started to take the priest up to Rugby and later Grantham, the Midlands up there. Um, it's kind of infrequent. Um, Wales, 2015, uh, and now other places as well. I have a question. Um, it seems like, seems like uh, Father Morgan was going to, uh, you know, you, um, going to the resistance. What happened to, to Father him? Morgan? Um, fa okay. Father Morgan, where do I begin this? Father Morgan is, uh, yeah, he, Father Morgan would tell people who were resistance that he was on their side. Unfortunately, he wasn't prepared to publicly do anything to oppose his superiors. Now, that's a contradiction that can only last for so long. Our Lord says you can't serve two masters. To give you one little example of this, um, there was a threat think at the end of 2012 that I was going to be denied Holy Communion because I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> and I said to Father Morgan, it would have been completely unjust, of course. But I said to Father Morgan, he, he, he came to dinner one time and uh, I said to him after dinner, would you have carried out that threat had I not left the SSPX already? They'd never carried it out because I stopped going to the society. Um, and he, would you have done it, Father Morgan, if they'd ordered you to? And he said, um, well, um, you know, etc., etc., etc. He ummed and ahed about it, and essentially that means yes. And, and so it went on. Father Morgan, he's a good man, but he, he, um, he was talking about the district seceding from the SSP Act. I don't think in the end he really had enough conviction to do it. The reason why he didn't carry it out is because you, um, that was when you dropped Igni's Ardens. Oh, that's true, actually, yeah. You dropped Igni's Ardens, and then you did. That's true. And then he said he was that's true, yeah, that's true. Okay, yeah, that's true. It was involved in Nicholas Arden's, yeah, yeah. But I think they would have done it anyway for, for what it's worth later on, but we went to the SSP. Um, yeah. He's, Father Morgan is now living at Montgardin Priory, by the way, you'll be pleased to know. Montgardin is a priory in the French Alps. I think it belongs to the French district, I mean, and it's a priory that consists 100% of priests who have no responsibilities whatsoever. So partly it's used as a sort of prison for troublemaker priests, they place them there and then they have pretty much no contact with the faithful. But it's also a, a sort of sabbatical retreat house. Father Morgan, a priest living at Mongardan, told me Father Morgan is going kayaking every day, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, and he, he's, he's having a whale of a time. Meanwhile, there is work to be done. I mean, I wish him well, but he, um, yeah, we were right not to place too much hope in personalities. Now, with the resistance, I suppose, really, when we started, I wonder if there was already a, a the, the kernel of a split, um, of a potential split in there. Because some people came to the resistance understanding that the issue was doctrine and that the issue was standing by our Lord. And other people were there simply because they had always been big fans of Bishop Williamson and if Bishop Williamson is involved in this movement, this whatever, then I'm with that because I'm with him. Um, and unfortunately, they're still placing all their hope uh, in, 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 in the name of Bishop Williamson. Um, we, we knew that there was a problem with Bishop Williamson um, probably two years ago, two and a half years ago, three years ago, we started to see signs that something was really not right. But back then, cast your mind back to the way things were. In those days, if you had gone to people and you had said, Bishop Williamson is destroying the resistance, they'd have locked you up in an insane asylum. They, they, would have, they would have laughed at you. Now people can see a bit more clearly because 
thanks be to God, he, he's actually come out and said what he thinks a little bit more clearly. Um, I, I want to read just a very brief <coughs> quote here. Um, you've probably read it already, but I'm, I don't care. I'm going to repeat it anyway, because it's just so great. This is St. Um, this is Basil the Great. If traitors have arisen from among the very clergy themselves, let not this undermine your confidence in God. Pay attention to this. We are saved not by names, but by mind and purpose and genuine love toward our Creator. St. Matthew the Great. We're not saved by names. Bishop Williamson is a big name. And pr part of the problem is, if we criticise him, or if we disagree with him, or if we attack what he says, inevitably we are going to be accused of making personal attacks. And it's a very easy accusation to make, and it's a very difficult one to defend yourself against. Consider the following, please. The reason that there is a problem with, are there really miracles in the new Mass or not? Can we assist at the new Mass and build our faith or not? This would not be a problem other than for the fact that it's Bishop Williamson saying it. If it were just somebody who no one's ever heard of, it wouldn't be an issue. But because it's Bishop Williamson, the person is part of the problem, unfortunately. Um, that's the way it is. This is the situation that we're in. I didn't desire it, you didn't desire it, but nevertheless, here we are. We can't run away from it. And finally, please consider the following. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what Greg Taylor thinks, it doesn't matter what Bishop Williamson thinks, it doesn't matter what any of us think or say. The new Mass is an insult to Almighty God. It offends Almighty God. And therefore, when Bishop Williamson says that the new Mass can be a good thing, can build your faith, <coughs> that is an insult to our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord has been attacked and he has been insulted, and he is offended by this, are you going to stand there in silence and allow that to take place? Or are we going to raise our voice, and are we going to say, I'm sorry, but this is wrong? And finally, I, I, if people are going to attack me and say, uh, you know, this guy, Greg Taylor, he, he, you know, he, he hates Bishop Williamson and he's making personal attacks and he's dividing the I don't mind, really. I don't care. Nothing. I don't have much of a good name to lose uh, at this point. And finally, what needs to worry us is more, what is Almighty God going to say to us at our judgment? The new mass is not good. It should be avoided by everybody. This is just common sense. I can't even believe that we're having this discussion in the resistance. Um, um, and that's what it comes down to, finally. And you have to have confidence in Almighty God. This is just a little blip. We will persevere and the resistance will grow, in spite of all the hideous plots and conspiracies of the enemy, in spite of all the lies, uh, in spite of everything that is going on. The fact that we are able to do this here today is, is kind of semi-miraculous when you think about it because the resistance in this country had as its main opponent somebody who was sort of on the inside and that's just deadly. If we get attacked by people on the outside, we grow. The SSPX attacked the resistance and every time they tried to do that, we grew. They brought new people to us who didn't know about us before, who actually read what we were saying and listened to the sermons on YouTube and said, you know what, these guys are actually right. Um, and uh, so they stopped doing it. They went silent after a while. They just pretend that we don't exist. That's a far more clever tactic, by the way. Um, now we're being attacked by people supposedly on our own side. But don't worry about that and don't be afraid of the word split. People are terrified of this. They are terrified of the word split. But in reality... Truth divides. It unites, but it also divides. Um, Sermon on the Mount, I think it's Matthew 
chapter 10, is that right? Don't think that I came to bring peace. I came not to bring peace, but the sword. Truth unites, and at the same time, it divides. And in reality, the church has always gone through this. Remember that it's obvious for us, with the benefit of hindsight, to look back at the Protestant Reformation and say Luther was a bad guy, these guys were Catholics. At the, at the start, they were Catholics. And even when they kind of weren't anymore, they still looked to the outside world like they were. So to the outside world, it looked like there was a split. And eventually, the church had to use excommunications and so on. And then once things were more clear, and there was a clear, obvious divide, then the truth could flourish and grow. And then there was real unity in the church, because the source of unity, of course, is truth. No truth, no unity. Truth, unity. Okay? It's the same thing here. If there is a split, it's not really a split. All that's happening is they don't believe the same as us anyway. They think that you can go to the new mass and it can build your faith. Not only that, Bishop Williamson says the new religion can build your faith. He says the new religion can build your faith. What on earth are we doing if the new religion can build your faith? I would accept, uh, I mean, I would understand, I would have some sympathy for a, a Novus Ordo liberal Catholic telling me that the, the the conciliar, he wouldn't call it the conciliar church though, that the conciliar church can build your faith. But he wouldn't call it the new religion. If you call it the new religion, you're admitting that it's something new. And if it's something new, it's not handed on, tradidi qualetaceti. It's something new. And yet, nevertheless, it can build your faith. I'm sorry, this is unacceptable. But they believe something different. Fine. If you're prepared to defend that, fine. We don't agree. Goodbye. That's the essence of. It's a split, but a split is not something we need to be terrified by. It's something that unites, really. It looks like a division. But all that is happening is two different <coughs> beliefs. That hidden difference is becoming visible. And we have to thank God that it is more visible because it, pre it presents less of a danger to people, the fact that it's becoming visible. And in the meantime, what do we do? Well... We simply carry on um, as long as uh, you really desire to stay Catholic and as long as you don't take it for granted and in your daily prayers thank God for the enormous grace to have the faith in these times and ask him, ask him uh, um, as a gift, ask him for the grace that you, that you can persevere in this. And ask to be enlightened by the Holy Ghost so that we see opportunities and when we see something that needs to do, we go in there and do it. That's the spirit that we have to have and, and we have to be apostolic. We have to not be selfish. We have to say, how can I, I, a mere layman, how can I do something to help spread the faith? There's no such thing in the end as a mere layman. Almighty God knows the future and he knows what you are capable of. He knows your strengths and your weaknesses and he will have uh, some plan in mind. I'm going to get this chap to be instrumental in this way, but you have to just be open to that. I'm going to give you one example. Um, uh, a very famous traditional Catholic layman. Again, I'm going to be accused of making personal attacks, but so be it. It's not, I, I have no hatred for him. I have, just as I have no hatred for Bishop Williamson, I'm very saddened by all of this. Um, there's a very famous layman in traditional Catholic <coughs> circles called David Allen White. Uh, many of you know, who, know him and have met him. Now, if there was anybody who could have rung the alarm as a layman and done a huge amount of good in 2012 when the liberalism kicked off and when the changes started to happen and when the SSPX began to be pointed in a new direction, if there was any one layman who could have made a huge difference, he could have made it. He should have been going around America giving Shakespeare talks in every single chapel and telling people, this is what you need to do, you need to support the resistance, you need... And he, what did he do? Absolutely nothing at all. So far, he's given two conferences in Broadstairs about Charles Dickens, and I wasn't present at the second one, I was present at the first one. I, I can't really praise it very much because I... Anyway, I asked him several times to come here to the resistance in London. Give a Shakespeare talk. 
give a talk about Shakespeare or about Charles Dickens or whatever, it would have been a huge boost. That would have been a big name. People from the SSPX who didn't really know what was going on would have been drawn to this by the big name of David Allen White. And he could, as he's very talented at doing, he could have used, uh, drawn lessons out of the text, because after all, human nature never changes, to teach people, to show them this is what's happening now, this is how you need to respond to it. He could have been an enormous help. I asked him again and again. Um, I met him in Vienna, Virginia in 2013 at the 25th anniversary. I asked him there. And it was always, yes, but he never quite managed to do it and, and so on. That's one particular example. But it doesn't, you don't have to have a big name like that. You can, be no, you can be an absolute nobody. And you can still do a huge, huge, huge amount of good. Um, and one of the things I think we are seeing in this crisis and the lesson that we will learn from it and the lesson that other people will be taught from it is, is there's no room for this sort of fatalism or inevitability. And the, the way that grace works, it can't be calculated in a spreadsheet. It, it can't be put into a computer and you can't predict the results from it. You could start with two people or just one person completely isolated in a remote part of the country. And who knows, in 30 years' time, that's where there may be a traditional Catholic school and priory and a huge church with three masses on Sunday as a result of that one man's faith. This is, I'm, this is true. And those of you who remember the Society of St. Pius X in the early days, in the 1970s, there are, one of Father Pfeiffer's former parishes, I think, started, correct me if I'm wrong, it was about a dozen people in a garage, and it was basically one family, grandma and grandpa and so on, with mass in a garage. And it turned into a huge church, two or three hundred people, two masses on Sunday and so on. Is that, if I... <coughs> very much misrepresented that, Father? Uh, seven, seven people. Seven people, okay, sorry. Seven people. Denver, Colorado, is that the one? Uh, yes. Yeah, Denver, Colorado. Uh, but it's the same story everywhere. This is what we need to do. Um, <coughs> Father... Um, <coughs> I can't remember which it was. One of the Society of St. Pius X priests in London in 2012 when Bishop Fellay started excusing the council and making excuses for the council, and when other stuff started happening and the new direction of the Society of St. Paul had become clear, one of these priests gave a sermon in St. Joseph's Church, and he said to us, you do not have the right to stand by and watch this. You have got to do everything you can to oppose this. Not only must you not accept it, if you just do nothing, if you're just silent, if you just watch it happening, you are complicit in it. You're going to be, this is not, God is not going to win the victory without you helping him. He will, we will, this is one of the fallacies that we're presented with. We know that our side is going to win, we know that God will win the victory. But how does divine providence work? Divine providence works through human agent. And if you, that's either going to be you, or it will find, he will find somebody else. But we don't have the right to, to simply um, stand by and do nothing. And we, we have cause for hope, because whereas uh, this new round of liberalism, this new attack from the inside, this new attempt to get us all to accept a new mass, the danger coming, as it happens from Bishop Williamson, it would, uh, we would oppose it if it came from anybody else, um, whereas a year or so ago it was just Father Pfeiffer and you know, Greg Taylor and that crazy don't listen to them. Now, more and more people are beginning to see it. Um, five priests were here just the other day. There will be more. But even if there were none, we would still have to stand up and reject error and stand by the truth. As it happens, though, we're not on our own. You, you are part of a worldwide fight for the faith. There are people in Brazil, in South America, who are going through exactly what you are going through. There are people in North America, in the United States, in India, in Australia, and elsewhere throughout the world. You are not on your own. But even if we were on our own, we would react in the same way. Um.
I, I think I, I've said everything I want to say. If you, if you want to ask me questions... Uh, I, I wonder when, um, you know when uh, Bishop Williamson was expelled? Yes. You know, he went along. He went all along with all these motor profits, the new map. He was legitimate and he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. Yes. So when they, they expelled him, he sent a letter back to Bishop today. And as he said, uh, be prepared for a hell of a ride, right? Yes. And, um, and I was excited. He said, oh, that's is gonna, uh, this is going to get uh, good. Yeah. You know, but um, really nothing happened. Yeah. But if Bishop Williamson's only fault were that he had kind of not raised the alarm against the motu proprio and so on, I think we would forgive him that because, I mean, I, like everybody else, I didn't actually read the text of the motu proprio when it came out. People were saying it was good, mm, okay, I'm going to carry on going to the SFK, I don't really mind. Um, I didn't bother reading it, to my great shame. I should have done, I should have realised it was something bad, but I didn't. Um, and maybe Bishop Williamson didn't either, who knows, but okay, that's a human weakness, we can forgive him that. Um, what he said in this or that letter, I mean, at the moment part of the problem is his words, but it's also his actions. And uh, I'm not, one of the reasons I'm not telling you about this right now is because you know it all already. We've seen what he's done in the resistance in this country. Um, it, it's 90, 95% of people opposed the new direction of the SSPX in this country. Think back to 2012. How many people were there in 2012 in England and Wales and Scotland who were prepared to say, I agree with Bishop Fellow? You could count them on your fingers. The whole rest of the district was against this. Why is it that we don't have uh, uh, a huge resistance in this country? It's, it's because we had an enemy within, so to speak. We had a, 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 an unnatural force keeping us down from within our own side. But the other thing is we have to remember words. Okay, somebody writes a letter that sometimes they get things wrong. I've written things um, in here where I've read, I've read it again a year later and I think, oh, I kind of missed the point there. People make mistakes. But actions speak louder than words. What are his actions? What are our actions going to be? Anyway, uh, yeah. Okay. Some people don't want to believe it's happening either. To the SSPX, they, 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 they were comfortable at one time. Yes. And now it's not comfortable anymore. Yeah. It's very sad. Yeah. I, well, human nature. That's why they kept quiet. I mean. Yeah. Human nature doesn't change. Um, there's all, as G.K. Chesterton says, uh, every man has handy a thousand reasons for why he is right to do nothing. And it's true. <coughs> if you think back to, I think, 1970s, when the new mass came in, there were a lot of people who said, and a lot of priests in this country who said, I don't like this new mass any more than you, but you know, what can I do? Because, you know, and so there's always a good excuse. Unfortunately, um, yeah, a lot of people are com comfortable, they don't want to know. Uh, our Lord is truth, capital T. Do we really love our Lord? Because we can say that we do. But do we really love the truth? If you love our Lord, you love the truth. What does that mean? It means if you don't love the truth, if you're not loyal to the truth, how much do you really love our Lord? And the other thing is, of course, one of the kind of barometers you can use to see if you're on the right track. Am I uncomfortable? Am I sweating? Am I tortured? Am I really not enjoying this? Am I in a horrible situation? Okay, maybe I'm on the right track. Anything else, be worried. If you're comfortable, if you're having a nice time, be very worried. You're probably on the wrong track there, okay? You're f the fifth mark of the church, one holy Catholic apostolic and persecuted. But beyond that, the way of our Lord is, is the way of Calvary, isn't it? There's no resurrection without first the passion. There's no, there's no Christianity without the cross, as they used to say. In my experience of some people who have stayed in the SSPX, one of the close villages of the past, they believe, they strongly believe, to be safe if you go to Mass on If you can't go to Mass on Sunday, they want to try to get a room place. Yes. You have to go to Mass every Sunday. Well, it's a commandment of the Church that you need to sanctify the day. Now, Archbishop Affair tells us, and even without him, it's just common sense, uh, are you sanctifying the day by attending a Mass which is displeasing to God and which risks diminishing your faith? Putting yourself in danger, attending the wrong Mass which is 
compromising with the enemies of our Lord. Is that really sanctifying the Sunday? And I think the answer is no. But yeah, I think really, um, I d one or two people in Ireland have told me that this is particularly strong in Ireland. I don't want to, I'm probably going to get lots of uh, angry abuse from Irish people if I say the wrong thing afterwards. Um, if that were true, let's say, for argument's sake, I think we have some of the priests before the council to thank for that, just hammering this idea, you've got to go to Mass. Yes, you have to go to Mass on Sunday, but obviously that presupposes the idea that it's, that it's something that's pleasing to our Lord, because um, your duty is to, is to give praise to Almighty God and to sanctify Sunday. And, and I, I respectfully submit that we're not doing that if we're attending the new Mass. We're not doing that at the Indult Mass. And we're not going to be doing that at the Society of St. Pius X. Um, by attending the Mass of priests who have officially accepted Vatican II. Because we can't accept Vatican II. We just can't accept it. Again, why? Because it's an insult to Almighty God. Vatican II is an insult to Almighty God. It offends Almighty God. We can't accept it. And you, you, yeah. Yes. Anything else before we all have a mad dash to the tea and coffee? Any other questions no. at all? Jolly good. Well, I realise some of you have come a long way. <laughs>